Hi, welcome to Family Life Center. So glad that you're spending part of your weekend with us. I'm Pastor Sean and here are your weekly announcements. Life groups have started their summer session. We have five groups for you to choose from and there's a variety of purposes for these meetings. Some are Bible studies, some are about prayer, and some are more hobbies as their focus. So you can uh, look at one and join these groups. Now, how do you do that? We can do it a couple ways. You can download the Church Center app and then select Family Life Center as your church, and then go to the Groups tab. There you'll see the groups that are available. If there's one that's interesting to you and you'd like to join it, just click Join. That'll let the leader know that you're interested and then they'll reach out with more information on how to, how to get there. You can also go to our webpage, uh, familylifecenter.us, and then go to the Life Groups tab. That'll uh, give you the same information. You can ask to join and a leader will get in touch with you. So that's it for our announcements. Now, if you're on site, you may be wondering, where are the Hardy family? And so we are not here at the church, but we're with you online. So we'll let you know at the end of the service where we are. If you've got any guesses, uh, you can shout those out or put them in the comments. Uh, as we go into our time of uh, praise and worship, uh, here at Family Life Center, you know, we, we, uh, we uh, want you to be comfortable as you worship. So if you wanna stand, you can stand. If you wanna kneel, you can kneel. Or if you wanna lift up your hands or shout from the top of your lungs. Uh, however you worship, we want you to honor God and place your focus on Him.
Family Life Center, there are four ways that you can give. Number one, you can give online at our webpage, familylifecenter.us forward slash giving. Number two is you can download the Church Center app and give through there. Number three is to text to give. Just text the number 84321 and then text the amount to get started. And number four, you can always mail your check to the church. Or if you're here in person, you can drop off your gift in the giving box, either before, during, or after the service. We trust you to trust God with your finances. When relationships are at their best, life is at its best. I think all of us have had moments when conflict in our relationships shows up and disrupts our life. And when those situations of conflict arise, it casts a shadow over your whole day. It may show up in the morning before you go to work with an argument with your wife, and then it kind of just hangs there throughout the day. You can't quite focus on work. You can't quite focus on your marriage. Likewise, it can also start off your day with positive interactions with your children. It kind of sets your day right, doesn't it? Now, uh, outside of your relationship with God, your marriage is the most influential to your life and the quality of your life. So that's why we're spending a few weeks here to talk about this relationship and how we can make marriage work. So this is part three. And so far we've talked about three keys to making marriage work. Yeah, the first week we talked about key number one, which was bringing God into your marriage. And last week we talked about two more keys, which was dismissing the myths of marriage and counting the cost of marriage. Mm -hmm. So this morning, Ashley and I are going to share one more key with you, and it's this. To make marriage work, you must focus on yourself. Other than our relationship with God, no, no relationship impacts us more than marriage. And that is why our choice in a marriage partner is so important. You know, once you're married, the focus shifts from, you know, choosing or finding the right person to being and becoming the right person for your spouse. You know, focusing on yourself kind of sounds strange, doesn't it? It does. So much of the emphasis of what we hear from the pulpit and what we're taught in children's church is to focus on others. We talk about serving others. We talk about 
showing compassion for others. We talk about reaching out to others. But when it comes to making marriage work, we need to focus on ourselves rather than the other person. You know, making marriage work means it's all about me. Now, say that with us. It's, it's all, all about, about me. me. I think we need to do that one more time for good measure. It's, it's all, all about, about me. me. <laughs> making marriage work means that you need to focus on yourself, on myself. Now, this is counterintuitive, and you may have a difficult time accepting this at first. But if you're going to see progress in your marriage, you need to realize that you control one part of the equation. And do you know what that part is? It's, it's you. It's me, not the other person. Now, this series is called From Me to We. And making marriage work, it starts with me. Now, when I say this, I'm not talking about being selfish or self-centered and or childishly demanding that the marriage center around your needs. No, what we're talking about is a radical shift in your attention from your spouse to yourself and what things you can change and control. So you need to focus on yourself. Okay, so I think we got that covered. We can go home, right? Yep, focus on yourself. No, <laughs> not so fast. So now that we know what the key is, let's talk about how we do this. So there are three action steps that you'll, that'll help you focus on yourself. So step number one is stop the blame game. Often in marriages get log jammed and stopped working because each of the spouses are what, playing what we call the blame game. You're no longer intention, or interacting positively, so now you play the blame game and are mistakenly thinking you're making progress. Instead, there's an impasse because you're both pointing fingers at the other person. So why do we play the blame game? Well, it has to do with our sinful heritage. We came in the world sinning. No one had to teach you how to sin. You figured that out by yourself because it's in your nature. How do we get there? Our sinful heritage goes all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had a marriage created by God. It was, if there ever was a marriage that was made in heaven, it was theirs. God put them together. Actually, we could take that a step further and say they were made for each other. Yeah, and they were uh, married and in love in the garden. And the expectation for both of them is that they would enjoy this perfect union for the rest of their lives. But we know that this isn't true, right? No. You know, sin entered into the garden and entered into their hearts. And then we see them playing the blame game immediately following. So uh, turn with us to Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at a few verses here to kind of see their response to uh, sin. Now, starting in verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So we see that the result of their sin is shame. You know, they try to cover themselves up. And this action shows, shows us that they both knew that they violated God's command and they both have sinned. So let's look at verse eight. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord uh, God among the trees of the garden. You see, sin makes you hide from God. Sin makes you run from God. Sin says, let's get away from God. I don't know how he's going to respond to what we did. There's almost like this fear of what he might do. But we never need to be afraid of God's response to us when we're in relationship with him. So they're moving away from God. But listen, God moves towards them. See in verse eight, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? You know, God always comes running for you when you've made a mistake. You know, he doesn't throw you out because you messed up. No, he comes looking for you. Now, verse 10, he says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now, how many of you would say that this is a pretty straightforward question that should have a straightforward answer? I, I mean, yes or no. Yeah, it's either yes 
or no? It's not complicated. You know, did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Yes or no, Adam? <laughs> so God is asking this question, and it's not just to play the gotcha game. I mean, God knew what he did, uh, but he's giving Adam an opportunity to take responsibility so that God could, could, uh, could, could give him some reconciliation for what had happened. God's not just trying to make him feel bad here. He's trying to restore him. Instead, we see Adam kind of taking the alternative route. Sounds like one of our kids. <laughs> right, right. He's like, <laughs> I'm going to go with option number three, Dad. <laughs> yeah, not yes or no, not taking responsibility, but the alternative route. So he didn't give a straightforward answer, yes or no, but says this, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit and I ate it. So the woman made me do it. And then on top of that, he says, the one you put with me. So he's actually not just blaming Eve, but he's blaming God. Now, this is so twisted that we can in no way make an excuse for Adam. But before we start piling on the men here, I think we should see what, what the woman did, what Eve's response was to this question. <laughs> so verse 13, uh, the Lord asked her, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So Adam, he blames Eve and God. And then uh, Eve says, I'll do one better. The devil made me do it. Now, no one wanted to take responsibility uh, and nobody really wants to take responsibility, I think since the beginning of creation until now. And in our marriage, it's like we keep blaming him or her for the problem, but we don't see that we have a responsibility for our actions. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of that going on, isn't there? It is. And the blame game is counterproductive. It never moves us towards resolving our problems. The issue at the heart of this is the blame is always seen as an attack. And every time there's an attack, what do we do in response? Right, we want to defend. Right. It's called the fight or flight response to an attack. And when we are defensive, we fail to take responsibility because we see the blame as an attack that we either need to fight or flee. We end up arguing or you end up stonewalling and kind of shutting down. And then what occurs is something called blame stacking. So where blame leads to more blame, which stacks up over months, over years, and decades. And couples get stuck as a result of blame. And perhaps you're there today, and you and your spouse cannot seem to talk without pointing fingers at each other. So, so how do we get ourselves out of this mess? Well, Jesus talks about this um, in Matthew. So let's take a look at Matthew 7, uh, 1 through 5. It says, Refuse to be a critic full of bias toward others, and judgment will not be passed on you. For you'll be judged by the same standard that you've used to judge others. The measurement that you use on them will be used on you. You'll be judged by what? The same standard that you use towards others. Perhaps you've heard this before, that when you're pointing your finger at someone, how many are pointing back at you? Three. Three, exactly. Let's go on to verse three and see what else he has to say. Why would you, fo why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's light, yet fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of even more? Now, I want you to notice something interesting in the way Jesus said this. Why would you notice the flaw? Notice, it's singular, right? Why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life, yet fail to, to notice the glaring flaws on your own? Did you see that? Jesus uses the plural flaws to describe you and a singular flaw to describe the person you blame. So verse 4 says, how could you say to your friends, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of even more? You're being hypercritical and a hypocrite. First, acknowledge your own blind spots and deal with them, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. Notice again, first acknowledge your own blind spots, plural, and deal with them, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot, singular, of your friend. So Jesus is saying that you need to break the cycle of blaming by first focusing on your flaws and your blind spots before you move to pointing fingers at your spouse. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I think Jesus has some wise words. Mm -hmm. So we always look for that one thing that's wrong in them, but there's 
probably a lot of things that we can work on too. So mm -hmm. if you're going to make marriage work, uh, you need to focus on yourself and stop playing this blame game because you're mm -hmm. going to lose. So that's step one. Mm -hmm. Stop playing the blame game. Step two is stop playing God with people. Now we have this tendency to play God with people around us, don't we? You know? mm -hmm. And what does that mean? What does it mean to play God? I mean, play God kind of means that you're trying to convict someone that, th that they're doing something wrong and you want to make them feel bad at what, about what they're doing so that they'll stop doing it. And after you convict them, then you're, seeing, you're seeking to do what? You're seeking to convert them, to change the person, so that they'll be the person that you want them to be. And ultimately, the problem with playing God is that you're trying to control people. Because when you're trying to control them, to manipulate them, to convict them and convert them, and, you know, you're actually getting in the way of God. You, know, you need to realize that you and I, we can't change one another. You know, when we sermonize, <laughs> we're trying to get into their head, you know, we're leaving little notes around and, you know, they'll try to pick up, you know, we're trying to be that voice in their life. We're trying to be the loudest person that they hear. But the problem with that is they're only hearing you. And so when God's trying to speak to them, he can't get through because all they hear is you. So you and I, we're not God. We need to resign that position if we're trying to play God in the life of others. You know, the Bible instructs husbands and wives on what part that they should play. So if you're not going to play God, which part should you be playing? Well, I'm a husband, so I play the role of the husband. She's the wife, so she'll play the role of the wife. So we're going to read from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 in a moment. And we're going to hear from Peter, who is talking specifically about these roles of a husband and wife. So Peter, uh, just a little background on him. I mean, he was married. Uh, we know this because Jesus went to his mother-in-law's house. So Peter is talking from experience here. And this is a, the instruction that he gives to us. And I think, uh, actually, what we'll do is when it's the wife's turn, the women will repeat the words. And when it's the husband's turn, the husband, you know, you'll, the men, they'll uh, repeat the words. So who's up first? Uh, the wives. Okay, ladies, read along with me. First Peter 3, 1 and 2. Wives, fit in with your husband's plans, for then, if they refuse to listen when you talk to them about the Lord, they will be won by your respectful, pure behavior. Your godly lives will speak to them better than any words. Have you ever kn known a guy who refuses to listen? <laughs> Probably. <yeah. laughs> there is not a man who isn't guilty of that. I think it starts young. Our boys <laughs> have a hard time, too. <laughs> but Peter continues, who refuses to to listen about the Lord, they will be won by your respectful and pure what? Your sermons? No. Your helpful notes that you leave around the house? No. They will be won by your behavior. Because your godly behavior, your example, will speak better to them than any words will. And if they won't listen, don't resort to, to playing God by convicting them trying to change them or control them. No, focus on your behavior and let your godly example win them over. I heard that. I mean, that, that's great advice. I was listening here. Good to know. Okay, Ned. <laughs> now it's our turn. So read with me. We're going to go to verse 7. So find your spot there, verse 7. Uh, Husbands, you in turn must treat your wife with tenderness, viewing them as feminine partners who deserve to be honored. For they are co-heirs with you of the divine grace of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So let's back that up just a moment here. So that nothing will what? Hinder your prayers. And so you're saying my, my prayers will be hindered? So when I hear that, I want to kind of back up the train a little bit and see what's causing these unanswered prayers. So let's look at the job of a husband. Husbands, you're to honor your wife. So what does that mean? Well, honor is to put someone above you or to regard someone as better than yourself. So wives are you know, not unequal or lesser than husbands. You know, they're co-heirs with us, with our husbands. So we honor them so that our prayers will not be hindered. Uh, honor is a behavior, is it not? And so it's not just your intentions or your thoughts or merely words. 
I love this connection. I'm just thinking about this, how prayer is talking with God with our words, but God is looking at our behavior and saying, are you honoring your wife? Because if you're not honoring who I've placed in your life, why should I listen to your words? Uh, so those are some things we need to consider. Now, these instructions matter to us because Peter's saying that wives need to focus on their behavior and husbands need to focus on their behavior. So we need to stop playing God and start playing our God-given roles and parts as husband or as a wife. That's right. Stop the blame game and stop playing God. So those are the first two steps. Number three, adjust your expectations. Now, what are expectations? They're anything that you anticipate or believe should be happening in your relationships. Expectations are shown by what we say ought or should be happening in our relationships that are not happening. And we all have an internal list of expectations. When an expectation is fulfilled, then it obviously leads to feelings of joy and happiness. But when someone does not meet our expectations, then it leads to feelings of disappointment. And the problem with disappointment is that if it's not resolved, then it doesn't stay disappointment. It becomes something else. You don't just stay disappointment, disappointed forever you eventually get angry. That's right, you get angry and that person that you love or you thought that loved you, and they're not gonna change and meet your expectations. So that's very you know, worrisome. And I was expecting Ashley to affirm me when I was feeling low, and she added to my sa sadness by making it about her and not realizing that I, I needed her to lift me up. How dare she? Uh, now. These events, I'm just kind of, you know, that's one event, but you know, these events add up because they're disappointing. And because I expected her to do something that she's not, well, now I'm getting kind of angry. The more that I think about what I was expecting and this didn't happen, the more I get angry and the more it begins to kind of boil within. And so anger may spill out in words or actions uh, because anger, I think, it gets attention, you know, but it doesn't get us anywhere. And anger, you know, it fails to produce that outcome that we want, which is for them to change their behavior and meet our expectations. Mm -hmm. Now, anger fades. Sometimes we're, you know, a little bit more angry. There's a higher temperature, and sometimes we're not. It's a little bit weak. But don't get fooled. Your anger, it's going to lead you somewhere. And if it's left unchecked, it's going to turn into something called bitterness. Yes, and bitterness gets inside you and just fills you up. And then you feel the sense of frustration of the relationship where everything gets brought up. All the past disappointments just start to boil and you're angry and you're bitter and that's not, not good. Yeah. Well, as uh, one man said, you know, when my wife gets into an argument, she gets historical. And the pastor said, you mean she gets hysterical? No, I mean she gets historical and she goes back. I mean, she goes over everything that went wrong in our marriage. That story about us. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't uh, mask that one very well, but isn't it true for us? I mean, isn't it? I mean, uh, we not only get hysterical, but we get historical too, uh, where we bring up all this bitterness to the surface. And so we see this kind of this trail and how we got there. You know, we see disappointments, and then it turns to anger, then it turns to bitterness, which leads us to a divide. And so this is why we need to adjust our expectations before bitterness and division rear their ugly heads. Right. So in marriage, there are some expectations that we have, and there's a whole list, and we just want to you know, kind of go through those uh, point by point. Right, some, some big ones that everyone has in their marriage. So there is an expectation about affection and physical intimacy. Obviously, you're getting married, you expect a little touching from your spouse. Yeah, yeah. I think it's the children in the room. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Also, I think household responsibilities is a big one. You know, who's going to do the dishes? The, the house doesn't clean itself. Maybe someday. That'd be nice. All right. <laughs> someday it might clean itself. But yes, until that point, you got to decide who's doing what. Um, attention. So I feel like this is a very reasonable expectation to, you should be able to spend time with the person that you, you've chosen. Yeah, yeah, and these are reasonable. I mean, they're, we're not talking like these are unreasonable here, uh, but there are things that are gonna show up in marriage. Uh, now, another one is extended family relationships. Now, I've been wanting to bring this up, but uh, there's a lot of times your family just kind of shows up. I mean, what's up with that? 
And there's a lot of times your family doesn't because of geography. It's sure, okay. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, mom, dad, I know you love me. Yes. And speaking of moms and dads, let's talk about parenting and discipline. Um, yeah, there's some, some ways that you parent the kids that aren't exactly the ways I think you should. I mean, you let them get away with a lot of things. Right, right. So we can have kind of a spectrum even in the marriage where one's more permissive and one's more of a disciplinarian. It's true. And so I'm not saying good or bad, but they're def definitely you different. definitely meet in the middle there. Yeah. Uh, another, another expectation is holidays. I don't think you think about this one getting, when you're getting married, but it, it kind of is a big deal if you don't live in the same city. You know, you're like, which family gets Christmas? Like, I, I, I don't even remember the last time that we went home to, for, to Kansas to Christmas, for Christmas. Because we never have. That's why you don't remember. I don't know why that. I'm not getting bitter about that. I'm just saying it's never happened. Uh, but, you know, who gets Thanksgiving? Now, we, we have, have done Thanksgiving. We have done Thanksgiving. Yeah. So we kind of, you kind of figure out what holidays to celebrate, uh, where, where to go for the holidays. And it can be, you know, something that can cause problems. And we have spent Christmas with your family when they've come here. That's right. They have come. Yes. Yeah. So that's why. And we are vacationing with them this week. So okay. vacations and entertainment are also something else that you have to make expectations on for your marriage. Um, thankfully, we have similar expectations about vacations. Our entertainment's a little different. You know, you're more of an inside guy. I'm more of an outside person, but... Yeah, and that sounds like a lot of work to me, like to go outside. Which, speaking of work, that's another expectation, you know, like how much you're going to work, uh, how little you're going to work, and, and then that ties into finances, which is another big one. Now, usually, you know, normally I think a spender marries a saver. At least which is that, true in our case. That would be common sense uh, to do that, right? You know, if I'm not, if I'm spending a lot of money, I want to kind of make, marry somebody that's going to hold me back. But what ends up happening is there's kind of some different ideas about finances and that can be a recipe right. for what's problems. A, what's a priority in our spending and what, mm -hmm. is it necessary, is it not necessary? Yeah. yeah. And lastly, a spiritual pursuit. So one person may be passionate for God and maybe the other person may have dust piling up on their Bibles. But just what's the expectation in our marriage regarding that? That's right. And then you could, we could list a few others. I think there's like handling conflict and disagreements. Uh, you, you know, you're arguing. One's arguing. One kind of shuts down. Uh, you kind of have to guess what they're, what, what uh, triggered them and what, uh, what they're feeling. You know, and then you have like this whole dynamic of I expect you to complete me versus I expect you to compliment me. And so, you know, there's just a whole lot of expectations you come with into a marriage. Now, there's a lot of expectations, but there's some things about expectations that uh, are kind of like the, that'll create the more and more problems. And that's the type of expectations you have. So let's talk about a few of those types of expectations. Right. So expectations are good, but we need to keep them in check. Make sure they're not unrealistic. Like, I expect you to help me clean the house, but it would be unrealistic for me to expect you to do it exactly the same way I do it because you're different. Yeah, and thank you for realizing that's un unrealistic. Um, another one would be making those ex expectations unfair. So it'd be unfair, you know, like to say the kids are, you know, acting up and causing problems. So since they're with you, it's your fault. <laughs> right. You know, it's like that's an unfair expectation, you know. And so there's two, in our case, there's two parents in the household. And so it'd be unfair to put all the responsibility on one person. Right. Also, if expectations are uncommunicated, I mean, I've learned this with Sean, if I don't clearly tell him what I'm expecting or what should be done, that it won't register. Like, he, he can't read between the lines. Like when he went grocery shopping during the lockdown so I didn't have to go, you know, as a safety measure, being pregnant and all, um, it took us three trips before I realized how much I needed to communicate to him for him to bring back what I was expecting. So, but once we got a list with pictures and exactly <laughs> the size I wanted, some extra sticky notes, he did great. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I got an A grade from her on a couple trips. So yes. I did get that one figured out. <laughs> I think you bring up some good points and it's about negotiating. You know, you, if you're having uh, expectations that are just, you're not going to budge, you can't negotiate, you're going to have a lot of problems. And so one of those for us, those expectations was, like when I, when she saw that I go to McDonald's quite a bit, you know, when I was in Michigan, it was just right there across the street. 
And so that became an issue and had a lot of kind of fights about that. So what we did is we negotiated a price. So if I spent under $5, you know, you know, we didn't have an argument later. And so that worked for a while, but then we kind of had to you know, adjust. Figure, yeah. Yeah. And expectations can't go on forever. Like eventually sometimes you have to adjust them. So, you know, I think we have adjusted. It's not $5. I uh, feel like you've cut out a lot of McDonald's because it's unhealthy and, you know, better that you don't go there. And we've moved, so McDonald's is not so conveniently located for you to stop by. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, it's a little bit further, so it's not like right across the street. So, yeah, anyway, so you, you negotiate them and then you need to make some adjustments. So you gotta be aware of your expectations. You just can't adjust them at all. That's a problem. Uh, the final one is uh, unaccepting of personality differences. Now, now, we're not talking just about behaviors here. We're talking about real personality differences, the way that that person is wired. So we need to accommodate each other's differences, especially the personality quirks that we'll find. So instead of, that, instead of wishing that they would be different, you know, learn to accept their differences. So if we're going to be bringing these types of expectations into our marriage, there's going to be some problems. And so that's why it's important to be aware of your expectations mm -hmm. and how they add to the problems in your relationship. You know, no matter how great your marriage is, no matter how much we talk about expectations, your spouse is still not going to be able to meet all your needs and all your expectations. You know, I have an amazing wife. Uh, she's like Superwoman. I mean, she can leap buildings in a single bound. She can stop bullets with her hand. I mean, she's pretty amazing. And I would say anyone that's been married to me, you know, married to me for 11 years, they're pretty incredible. Now, listen, even after 11 years, uh, I still cannot meet her. You know, she can still not meet all my expectations. I can't meet all her expectations. And we still find ourselves getting disappointed from time to time because the other person didn't meet our needs. Yes, because people will fail you, right? Mm -hmm. And spouses will fail you. And that's why we ultimately need to place our expectations on God, who will never fail us. We need to have a life built on something else besides human relationships, because people will disappoint you. You need a rock that goes beyond human relationships. Mm -hmm. David knew this about people. They will disappoint you. He was disappointed by Saul when he threw spears instead of praise. He was disappointed by his own son Absalom, who turned against him and betrayed him. So David wrote these words in Psalms 62. We're going to start at verse 5. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense and I shall not be moved. Let me tell you today that your husband is not your rock. Your wife is not your rock. They might be a strong part of your life, but God needs to be your rock. He needs to be the rock of your life, and he is the only one who doesn't shake. Continuing on in verse 8 in Psalms, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Trust is something that you learn through experience. The psalmist is saying that even though he's been disappointed, and even though his life has been shaken by people, he is not moved because God is his rock. So the question that we want to close with is these. Is God the rock of your life? Is God the rock of your marriage? So right where you're at, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And we want to spend a few moments here in prayer as we close. Yes. So God, we thank you for marriage and we thank you that you've made it to be a wonderful, fun, exciting, encouraging thing. But God, we know that as great as marriage is, God, Lord, that, that you are greater and that we need to have our foundation of our lives built on you. And we, I pray today that as we, we close here and we go, that each of us would take a moment to, to assess ourselves and see if, if we are making you the rock of our lives, if everything that we have is built on your foundation. Yes, Lord. Yeah, Lord, as I'm thinking, Lord, I, I'm thinking of all these things that are being torn down around our nation, you know, all these statues and the things that have been standing for 80 years, 100 years. And Lord, it's just a sad thing to see. But Lord, I think even what's 
God got my attention even more is marriages that are falling. God, marriages, God, that are crumbling because they're not on solid rock. They're not based on you. So Lord, I pray for these marriages, Lord, that they would be founded on you, that you would be our rock, that God, is, uh, God all things are crumbling around us, Lord. God, and we can't count on, on uh, our spouse like we thought we could or others. We know they're gonna disappoint us, Lord, from time to time. But God, we come to you, God, for that ultimate satisfaction. God, that we could walk with you like Adam and Eve did in the garden, that we can have you in our relationship and know no matter what the other person does, God, I know I can always count on you. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we invite you into our marriage. We invite you into this church, Lord. May, may we be a marriage that is founded upon you, a church that is founded upon our solid rock, which is Christ. Mm -hmm. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for part three of Making Marriage Work. Uh, we're in Kansas right now, but we look forward to being with you in person next week as we continue this series from me to we. God bless you. That's it for our service. Now you know we're in Kansas, but we'll be back in person next week. We can't wait to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us online. If you haven't already, please click the subscribe button on YouTube. That'll make sure you don't miss any of the videos that we put out. And you can find us on Facebook. You can like our page and get up-to-date information. I want you to have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. God bless.